Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. John Tyus. I'm the founder of the IED Movement. I'm so excited that you're here. Give yourselves a hand clap for coming out. All right. And one more time, let's give a hand clap for Barbara Fant and her amazing, amazing talent and amazing gift. Yes. So um, I'm so excited about this. We, we decided to do a part two. A lot of people asked me to do a part two immediately following last year. Um, I did not want to move into a part two without first feeling the inspiration um, to do so. Because um, the first one was started by inspiration. So I wanted to make sure that I was being true to what I felt. Um, and I was contacted by Bishop Clark. I was contacted by Dr. Booth. And they were saying, when are you going to do this again? We still have some things we want to say. So um, I felt an unction at that point to be able to say, let's go ahead and move forward with a part two. And let's, let's wrap the discussion up. So now I'll introduce uh, our board members. Okay. Uh, right now, let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Mark Hampton. Uh-huh. And uh, let's give a warm welcome again to Pastor Eric Miles. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this second round of conversation for the ID movement. We are so excited. Before we move forward, can you just put your hands together for the visionary of the ID movement, Dr. John Tyus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one, of, one of our city's powerful young men who is shaking up, who's going to shake up the world. And we're so excited about what he's doing. Uh, tonight, we want to begin uh, this series uh, or this, this discussion with you. But we want to remember a couple of people before we get started. We want to re remember two very important panelists who are not with us tonight. And, uh, uh, and uh, our, my cohort will be praying for them in just a moment. But one of the things that we want to do is we want to pray for God's presence to be in this room because you're in the midst of something powerful that's going to happen. And sometimes you need to know when you're in a moment, and I think this is one of them. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Dr. John Tyus. We thank you for this visionary. We thank you for his wisdom. We thank you for everything that has created him. We thank you for his mother. We thank you for his father who had vision for this young man. Now, God, we ask that you would be in the room. We ask that you would remember these panelists, all of them, God, in a very special way. We ask in the name of Jesus that your strength and your power would be present. We ask that you would open up our ears. We ask that we would be intrigued, we would be engaged, and we would be inspired by what we're going to hear. We thank you for what you're doing, and we ask that you would be in the midst of us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My uh, privilege to be able to pray uh, for um, Bishop Jerome H. Ross and Dr. Charles E. Booth. So I'm going to ask that you just join hands with the person that is beside you and let's uh, pray for them. Uh, Father, we just thank you on tonight that before we even go any further, uh, we want to celebrate and we want to salute uh, both um, Dr. Booth and Bishop Ross. God, what a tremendous legacy that they are leading and still living. And so, Father, we thank you because we know that you uh, are concerned about every intricate detail of our lives. And we know that our health, God, is right at the top of that. And so, Father, we speak to their bodies on tonight. We yes. speak to their minds on tonight. We speak to anything that's happening inside of them or even around them, Father, that if it's not of you, God, we pray that you remove it, God. We pray for divine healing. Yes. We pray, Lord yes. God, that you move up the healing process. Yes. God, we we pray, God, that you put them in the hands of the right doctors, God, yes. that you put them in the right hands of physical therapy, Lord God, yes. whatever yes. the journey that's necessary to produce the healing and the wholeness, God, into both of their bodies. God, we yes. believe it to be done. God, their work is not done. Their voice will not be silenced, Lord God. Yes. Their anointing will not be diminished, Lord yes. God. Yes. We even pray, Lord God, for their personal finances, God. Yes. We don't yes. want the devil to get anything or rob them of anything, God, that was assigned to 
to them in this season. And so, Father, we speak to everything that is supposed to be a part of their life now, God, the health, Lord God, and healing and finances, God, ministry assignments. And God, we pray that even this downtime, that's how we'll view it, God, downtime with you, God, that they will have taken full advantage, God, that when you restore them, Father God, that they will break forth and come out, God, fresh, God, and with more power and anointing than what they've ever had, Father. I pray that even now, God, that as we're praying for them, that wherever they are, God, in this city, that you send your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to just set on them now, God. I pray, God, that they sense the saints praying for them, God. I pray, Father God, that they sense a stirring in their spirit, Lord God. I pray, God, that you continue to mature the word that is inside of them. You said, Father, that you sent your word and healed them, God. So we speak the word of healing over them now, Father God. Let that word just find its way through the city and set on them now, Father. So God, we thank you, Lord God, that their voices will not be silenced. We thank you that their strength, Lord God, will not be weak, Lord God, but we thank you that they're poised, God, for the next level in the journey and in the relationship that they have with you, Father God. And we pray for their churches, God. We pray for their individual ministries, Lord God. Those people that they cover, Father God, in the spirit, God. God, that you increase them, Father. And God, we love you for them tonight, Father God. And we love them and we celebrate them with the clapping of our hands. And we believe that healing and wholeness and restoration is upon them now in the name of Jesus. You said whatsoever we ask in your name, believe and we can count it as done. Done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I have the uh, honor of introducing our first two uh, panelists on tonight. Uh, We have uh, Bishop um, uh, Eugene uh, H. Bellinger. Uh, So he is coming to the stage, H. Eugene Bellinger. uh, He is coming to the stage at this particular time. So would you all help me celebrate uh, Bishop Bellinger? He's wearing them shoes. I'm going to have to figure out what size he wears. Match my shirt. <laughs> Glory to God's name. Uh, we have one of the um, wonderful apostles in this city who has been proven uh, in his call and in his mandate into ministry. Would you all help me celebrate at this particular time, Apostle Lafayette Scales? Also, we have tonight uh, a man of God that needs no introduction whatsoever. Uh, He hails on the north side of our city. Uh, He's a general in the faith, Bishop Howard Tillman. And our last and not least of our panelists tonight uh, hails from us from the First Church of God on the southeast side, uh, one of our nation's most beloved preachers and pastors. Would you put your hands together for Bishop Timothy Joseph Clark? (laughs) Apostles, pastors, bishops. Thank you for coming tonight. Put your hands together one more time for the conversation with the fathers. So we want to challenge uh, their thinking tonight and hear from them relative to some of the cost or the sacrifices that have been made by them in their journey. My first question um, I'll leave open to any of you all that would like to take it first is the obvious one. Um, What did your journey cost you? You know, in our kingdom, um, sacrifice and uh, cost is part of the cost of discipleship. Jesus said, uh, if you will follow me, you must first of all deny yourself. And so part of the cost that that there's been in my life is the uh, cost of uh, self Denial. There are things that I want to do. There are things that I desire to do um, that I cannot do because of uh, times where I have to plan to neglect those desires to accomplish what I sense the purpose of God is on my life, and that is to develop leaders that can change our world. 
Self-denial has brought me to a place that where I see other people play, I have to prepare. And um, sometimes that can be a real tension in life because I like to play as well. So self-denial and, uh, uh, is a big part of the cost. Seasons of separation uh, and solitude so that I could pray fast and hear from God because my model for leadership is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew how to walk with the crowd, but at the same time, separate himself from people. And uh, when you're communal, as I am, I like to be with people. When God calls me away with him so that I could hear and receive instruction, I know that there's a whole world out there of six billion people where things are going on. But to draw away from him and then to come out of that place, uh, knowing that I have a fresh perspective on where he wants me to go and where he wants me to go with his people uh, is a cost uh, that has had to be paid. My family cost is also equally important because my children were born while I was in ministry, not as a pastor, but in ministry. The first two were born when I was associate minister at Union Grove Baptist Church, and my son was born at Ramah. Uh, and it's interesting that my family, including my wife, has had to share me with everybody that we have had to come in contact with. I didn't rely on the church to raise my family. However, there's been this shared dance that we've had to go through. And that has caused a real uh, serious conversations concerning balanced living. And balanced living, um, I still have not got to because I love what I do. So part of the cost has been the cost of listening to my wife. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought about it from the standpoint of uh, family, primarily. Okay. Um, I remember receiving the call to be an evangelist. And um, I, I kind of kept that a little secret from my wife when I married her. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I did not think that she would uh, uh, want to hear about somebody that's going to be traveling when we initially got married. And, um, uh, but w when, when the call really strong came to me to, to be an evangelist, I, um, we had just bought a house. And I tell the story, of, uh, I was working at Buckeye Federal and um, happened to um, say to the manager and others, um, could I take a leave of absence um, while I go on this journey to preach? And of course they told me at that time, we'll not allow you to take a leave of absence for preaching. Now if you have to go to armed services, we'll give you the leave of absence. So that blew that. And, uh, but I bought a house, and it, it was it was strange because I, um, I I told I went home and told my wife, listen, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and we're gonna buy a house. We are ready at this time. So um, she said, "You got to be crazy." I, no, I'm not crazy. We need to buy this house. So we went to Framingham, bought a house, Ryan Holmes, uh -huh. back in the cul-de-sac. And I closed them on my own loan before I left the job. And is that, is that permissible? Uh, is that legal? It was legal then. Oh, legal then. Yeah, no, it was a legitimate. It was it was all good. They had to approve it right. and everything. I just signed off on the papers. But but what happened? Uh, my my. Uh, I, Landon was born, so I was leaving home uh, when we had just bought a house. Um, my, uh, my son was not, was about two years old hmm. at that time. And it, it became uh, very tedious for her, probably more so than me, because uh, leaving her and sometimes being, at, I was at home, and didn't have a lot of meetings. That, that was the other thing. When I quit my job, I only had two meetings. I had two, and they weren't good meetings. 
<laughs> and, uh, and, and I had, but I had two meetings. My, and and uh, I went to my wife and said, you know, <clears throat> I can't stand watching you go to work while I'm at home. I did, it was just a man thing with me. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to take care of my family. And she, she said to me, she said, you cannot give this up because you know the Lord has called you to do this. So she paid a price for what God called me to do. I see. And um, she drove an old Valiant. It was a push button convertible. It was old. Hmm. She drove that Valiant everywhere. Drove a Volkswagen with a hole in the back of the floor. She drove that everywhere. She never complained. Mm -hmm. She never told me I'm tired of this life. She never one time said to me, I wish you had never been called. So for me, it was my wife that really paid a, a price I see. for the call in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I had to... Uh, think about it when the question came that I had to talk about her because she did something that just a lot of people wouldn't do and I appreciate that and, and I think when you have a wife like that you need to articulate it. That's good. That's good. I was sitting in the bed talking to my wife about church talking about how great the service was. She said hold on one moment. I was in the same church you was in I heard the same organ, same drum. I heard the same choir, same preacher. And she told me, I don't want church in my bedroom. I want some charm. I don't want no prophecy, I want some poetry. <laughs> don't want revelation, I want romance. And it shook me to the point that I thought everything revolved around church. Hmm. And I realized that I was about to lose something. Yes, sir. Because what I was attached to out there, I couldn't bring to my house. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may not agree with this. I know people said your family is first ministry. She ain't my ministry. She my baby. Mm -hmm. I don't, ain't her priest. Ain't her bishop. I go there to be with her and my children. And so, I think that woke me up one time, Mister yes. Tillman, because she was going like your wife. Every time we went, every time something happened, I was there. She was there. I said she tired. She having babies. So it was a rude awakening, but. I think the Lord allowed us to recapture and okay. bring the fire back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> um, I think my brothers have done a great job with the experiential aspects of the sacrifice. Um, I'd like to just discuss it from another perspective. Mm -hmm. um, one of the um, preachers who I greatly admire is a white preacher who's in heaven now, uh, who said that one of the big mistakes he made early in ministry was that he thought when I surrendered to the call that I would make a one-time payment of my life to Christ. Said, I didn't understand that uh, the bill comes $1.33, $5.72, sometimes $11, sometimes $20. It comes in spurts and it comes in different moments. And I think what I've had to do is across the years, write those checks at different times for different amounts. It would have been so much easier if I could have written God one big check and be through with it. But every day, he asks me for another check. And I'm just constantly making those payments on a life of surrender. Mm. Yeah. Good. In that same vein, I'm opening this question up to the entire panel. You can, you can answer it as you wish. In music, there is a cadence, there's a time signature. 
And uh, there is a great musician, many of you know his name, Miles Davis. Yes. He had a bass player by the name of Marcus Miller who played with him. Marcus said that he was playing with him one night and played a wrong note. Miles is the director, he's the elder. Marcus plays a wrong note. And in real time, Miles Davis changes what he plays to make Marcus's note make sense. As you have sons and daughters in ministry, can you speak to the fact that sometimes we may play wrong notes and you have to compensate sure. to make it right? Could any of you take that sure. question? Sure. <laughs> A father will cover you. And it's kind of interesting that a covering is the piece that cover, catches all the dirt. When you look at the tabernacle in the Old Testament, uh, uh, badger skin covered all of the valuables as it went through the wilderness. And uh, some of us are called to be badger skin. It's not pretty. It's nothing to be admired because all the beauty was on the inside. Because we are humans, we are prone and we have the capacity to make mistakes and malfunction. And because of that, there needs to be the voice of the ancients, the voice of wisdom to help us to correct. There are some times that I've seen people with good intentions doing wrong things. Uh, Paul is one of my models for leadership. And he was destroying the church because he thought it was the right thing to do as a Pharisee. That's right only to be stopped by God and then counseled by a man named Ananias mm -hmm. and told that you're destroying what you were called to build. I believe that the, vo the affirming voice of a father or a mother can help a child, a son or a daughter, correct their path when they're making that journey. And the wisdom comes from life experience. The wisdom comes from reading. The wisdom comes from uh, that wisdom that we have received from the ancients to help in that self-correction and in that mode of making uh, the journey. Um, I like to correct in, in private. Um, I found out that many times when there's relationship, it's easier to make those judgments. But as in your mouse example, uh, sometimes public mistakes are made. And we have to determine then whether we want to expose or cover the mistake that's made. I choose to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned that from the story of Noah, that when you come up on somebody, they've made, I mean, he's been on this ark all this time with all those animals, and he grows some grapes and gets drunk. <laughs> Say what you worse. will, that was Could've his response. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one son exposes, another son covers. Right. I believe that we can learn a lot from that. Do we want to go tell and expose everyone's faults and flaws? <laughs> Or do we want to cover them? There's a difference between covering, which means to protect and correct and to adjust, and a cover up. Cover up. <laughs> and I think young people really need to understand that. Yes, sir. That we're not out to kill you. That we're, we really want to help you. Yeah. We don't want to kill your ministry. We don't want to kill your future. We don't want to kill your dream. We want to do all that we can to help you. And if we can do that as you walk through this life and you make mistakes, we can show you that you can recover, get back on your feet, and do what Jesus said to Peter. He said, I prayed for you that your faith fell to God. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Let, 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 me, um, let me say this about your Miles illustration, um, because I love Miles Davis. And uh, the thing about Miles, though, Miles was a genius. And... Um, Geniuses aren't easy to live with. Um, in fact, I hope no one takes what I'm going to say wrong because you were asking about us with our spiritual sons and daughters. Geniuses, giants, and greatness are not easy to live with. Mm -hmm. And when you have a father or mother who is th that spiritually, Sometimes living with them and being under them is very chafing and difficult. 
But here's what I think happened when Miles did that. There were three things. Number one, a sensitivity. He could hear it. Mm -hmm. Only a, nobody else in that room probably heard it. He was a genius. Right. Sensitivity. I think the second thing is security. Mm. A lot of leaders are insecure, and so they get off making you look bad. Right. Yes, sir. But when you're secure, you can cover right. somebody. Exactly. And then the third thing is skill. He could pivot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you ought to look for that in a spiritual yeah. parent. Right. Somebody with skill, sensitivity, and a strong sense of security. Right. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> All right. Good all seed, right. good soil. Uh -huh. good, good seed, good soil. <laughs> I'll take uh -huh. you to lunch. Right. It's, it's rare when the answer is better than the question. Uh -huh. <laughs> what do you say to people that are out of line in ministry, in marriage, in finances, in business? How, let, let me come around because I feel almost inspired. I mean, what, what do you say to them to have them avoid um, potentially spending 44 years in the wrong line. Mm. How do you all save somebody to get them in the right line? We thank God for grace, but how do we get people in line tonight if they're in the wrong line? Um, I, you know, I, I teach and I believe this, that... Um, there are vocational callings and those vocational callings um, are, are given uh, to us and we cannot minimize their value. If I am in, in, in a ministry or somewhere I shouldn't be, I, it, it's, it's hard for me to tell you that you're not there if you don't know, you're not in the right place. So you have to know that. If you know that, then you have to make a decision as to what you're going to do or how are you going to transition if you think you should transition. A, a, a calling is, is, um, is something you cannot escape. That even if you're in another line of work, that calling is sealed inside of you. And you can't even run from it. You have to live with it. If you never transition to what the calling is, you have to live with that failure for the rest of your life. And I don't think anybody wants to live with that failure, knowing that I could have been, but I chose not to. Mm -hmm. And so I think there has to be a, a sense of really understanding because I've, I've never been there. So I've never been, this is one thing about me. I have never been afraid to take on something that was bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And that, and I think that, and you can't be intimidated by things you've never done before. I, I think that's why you have God. God. God helps you, especially in your prayer life. In your prayer life, he gives you what you need to pursue what you should pursue. That's why you gotta be, when you understand that, you pursue it mm -hmm. because God puts it there and you can't get away from it. So that's why I've kind of, um, label, put, put it in me. I was trying to say to myself, you know, when, when anytime God calls you to do it, do it. Don't, don't run from it. It's not the money that you're worried of, should worry about. It's who God is and what God is calling you to do because in the end, it's going to have more impact than any other vocation you would ever pursue. How do you feel about that, that whole space that Bishop was talking about? Any of you can, can speak up as you will. I, I think for me, when I, when I look at, I said the footsteps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, I think I missed some ordered steps. Hmm. But yet God put some steps in order so I wouldn't slip. And I often think, and I want to be transparent that when I came here 44 years ago, number one, I didn't come here to pass a church. Number two, I did not come here to make friends. I came here because my wife was in school. And uh, 
I think for 40 years, it hit my heart. I followed the steps of the old gods and the fathers and mothers of a denomination who said to son, found a building. I found a building mm. and they made me pastor, which is not what I wanted to do. But God gave me grace, gave me favor, and wonderful people who take care of me. I came here, and for years, it still haunted me, Bishop Clark. I mean, I love preaching, I love pastoring, I love people. But that was not who I am. I'm an educator, I'm a scholar, I'm an in-depth person. And for 40 years, I did what I was told to do by living in somebody else's anointing. Hmm. Somebody else's space. Hmm. Somebody else prescribed plan, you know, raised up in church. You're supposed to preach, you're supposed to pastor, you're supposed to be a bishop, you're supposed to be an apostle. But about four years ago, this is, and I, and I would say this to you, young pastor, four years ago, December the 21st, 40 years to the date, Bishop Tillman. Because he was the first person I saw that when I came. 40 years to that date. I start sensing, this is public, heaven says, the, 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 the sense of pastoring lifting off of me. Mm. The grace and favor lifting. I will always be a pastor according to biblical Hebrew standards. And somehow God had miraculously turned that around and put me where I came here for what I was designed for. What am I saying is that while I missed something and fought it, God has now given me renewed strength. I see. At 66. Hmm. It seems like my last four years have been better than my last 40 years. I see. Because my, though, though my steps that was order were out of order, I was in order with God. Yes. And uh, I think I'm grateful that I stopped beating myself up mm. for not having this and that and not being here. I stopped beating myself up because I thought I missed a mark, but it wasn't my mark to make. I thought I missed a certain number in my church, but it wasn't my number to have. And uh, so every now and then, Mr. Clark, I had to kind of slap myself and say, you're back in line now. You got friends. You got brothers and sisters now. And so uh, that's where I am now. Enjoying the ride, but every now and then I got to get off and spank myself and say, hold your head up. You're on the right road now. It's amazing that you all have reached this kind of apex because the next question that I wanted to ask you is to talk about the women. Well, just as Adam came from the womb of a man, I mean, uh, Eve came from the womb of a man, we all came from the womb of a woman. I want to ask you how women have impacted you in your life and in your ministry, and why? Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, Saturday, um, everybody's talking about um, Bishop Michael Curry's sermon at the wedding, and the cellist, and the gospel choir. I don't know if um, we really realized what happened with a single mother who raised that young lady to become mm. who she is today. Mm. Um, my mother, without the benefit of my father, raised us, worked uh, so that my grandmother really was the one who raised us during the day. So I cannot ever say enough about my mother. 
Um, she died February 21st, 1988, and it was a tremendously dark day for me. Um, partly because I was just getting to the place where I could do good stuff for her. Yes, sir. And I regret so much what I didn't get to do. Um, and then I had sisters um, who were very loving church mothers. Uh, so I, I don't think I would be where I am uh, without those women. My wife, even my mother-in-law, you've heard me say, I had the best mother-in-law in the whole wide world. And um, those women all impacted my life in ways I can never describe. And so, yeah, I, I think all of us who on this panel owe a debt to women. And then let's not even talk about the women in our churches and all they did uh, before the brothers got there. Because all of us have ministries to men now but many times it was good women who believed and held things together. So, yeah, I, I cannot say enough um, because it's emotional for me when I think about my mom and my grandmother and those women in my life. Yeah. Um, my mother, the disciplinarian, um, I, I never went to the Army but you would have thought I did. Yeah. By the way, my mother um, made me make up my bed every day, mm -hmm. and I couldn't leave the house without making up the bed. She taught me how to put starch in a shirt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, taught me how to set a table. Mm -hmm. Taught me how to wash dishes, dry dishes. My Mabel was a prayer warrior who really taught me how to pray. Okay. That I didn't know what prayer was in a personal life until I met her. My mother-in-law taught me uh, by her model of a wife what it was like for a wife to love her husband. And then my, the last person, Sister Good, uh, while I was a youth president, uh, was willing to tell me what I didn't want to hear, hmm. to uh, cause me to reconsider pers some traits I had uh, that were not good for the audience. Okay. And she confronted me and um, helped me to see myself. So those kind of persons, I think, have benefited me um, and I'll be forever grateful for what they did for me because it's made me who I am now. I will sound uh, the alarm on my mother uh, because she sounded the alarm on me many times. She just said, you need help, <laughs> and I'm going to help you. <laughs> and with her stern discipline and plus modeling and prayer and her steadfastness in the house of the Lord, uh, gave me a real tenacity and love for, for God's house and God's people. When my dad died and my mother took responsibility for raising three children at age 35 and did that, uh, she presented a model that with God and family together, plus church, we can make it. My wife um, is a woman in my life that's come alongside as a co-regent, joint heir, heir together, the grace of life. And as a lifelong partner, until death do us part was the vows that we took and that we're committed to. She's gone a lot of places in the world with me that, um, that I know she didn't want to go, but because I asked her, she went. And that's why at this stage in life, when she wants to go somewhere, mm -hmm. I put a stop and a hold on everything and say, that's where we're going to go and that's what we're going to do. Uh, when I look at women in my life, the women at Union Grove Baptist Church, we have what we call a missionary society. Yep. Yep. And we used to do an annual retreat out at Indian Village, out on Olentangy River. We had a missionary offering we took every Sunday. And um, those women would have us as youth kneel down, and before we ended that retreat, they would pray over us with laying on of hands. Yes, sir. 
And they would pray prayers like this. God, I may not ever go to Africa, but send Lafayette. God, I may not ever go to Asia, but send Lafayette. And they would pray to nations over me. So when I started traveling to those places and preaching in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines and uh, Singapore, when I started traveling to Zimbabwe and, and Tanzania and Uganda and preaching, when I started traveling to South America, I really believe that the ministry that's in me was put in me by the laying on of hands and prayer and the impartation by those praying missionaries that some of them would never set foot on those continents, but they prayed that I would go. And I carry the weight and the responsibility of that prayer Amen. to be an answer to those prayers. Amen. That's good. Uh, That's good. Uh, for me, as I shared last year, it, it's my mother uh, who I used to watch. My alcoholic father beat her and throw her against mm. the wall. And I had to learn uh, that's not the way of life. Uh, hmm. My aunt, who taught me how to be a gentleman, watching her with her husband. And then the organization I came up to, the old pilgrim organization, Mount Sinai Holy Church of America, with some of the strongest, powerful black women in America. Oh, yeah. The Cain Bishops. But here's the thing. Their husband was hunters. And so it wasn't about men and women competing, but that's the first time I ran into strong, powerful, educated, even some women who didn't have education, mm. uh, who impacted my life. Uh, I think uh, personally probably made, not probably made the biggest impact on my life, that little chocolate girl right there. Uh, because I was, had a great position at a church. And Tim and I was often talk about it. He and I were youth president years ago. We were like the two most popular people in the country. And uh, we were, because we was everywhere. And, and I, I gave it up in Newark, New Jersey, to follow her to school. And so uh, it tears me up, Clark, because had I not followed her, hmm. I wouldn't know y'all. No. Had I not come to Columbus, I would never know the greatness of all the men that we know where I travel. Somebody said, you don't know what God would have done? No, God wouldn't have done that. Mm. But that woman, because she made an impact on me, taught me how to love, how to respect, how to honor uh, women and my daughters, made an impact on me that my success, my real success, because of her, uh, she helped me through my challenges, my pitfalls, but I wouldn't be who I am. Yes, sir. And, and, and now say this, <laughs> I would not know you all had it not been for her. Mm. I've come to this city, <coughs> meet all you wonderful people because of her. I get a chance to be with Jake's and everybody calls him, mm. you know. So thank you. Thank you. That's the impact that you know, made on me. So. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet right now and put your hands together for this awesome conversation with the fathers.